Okay. Thank you so much for being Oh, wow, it got really quiet. <laughs> Somebody must have used a teacher voice to make people stop talking. I'm Sharon Joseph. I'm here with advisor Jim McAfee, Jenny Jones, our administrative assistant, and the voice on the phone, Chris Williams, who calls to remind you that you RSVP'd. I think that's so great that she does that. Our topic tonight is, in, is the basics, basics of investing. Now, I have to explain that a little bit. This is an LPL slideshow, so some of the slides are really wonky, you know, not the ones that Jody designs. You know, Jody's not here. He's on vacation, so I'm flying solo, which should give me a great deal of confidence. He won't interrupt me and correct me, <laughs> but it's much worse. It's going to be on Facebook, and so tonight, he'll look at it. And I can't fix it. So <laughs> speaking of fixing things, I got something wrong last time and Sam Weber was kind enough to wait until it was all over and whisper in my ear that I'd made a mistake. And I really appreciate that, but I need to correct it to you. I said that unemployment was 13% and that inflation was about 7%. Unemployment is only about 4%. It's very encouraging. I got the data from a New York Times article that was talking about the great, uh, what are they calling it, about people not going back to work. And they said they thought that the unemployment was really more like 13%, even though de the Department of Labor is, is saying that it's 4%. The great resignation, that's what they're, the great resignation. So that's where it came from, but Sam, I, I thank you. <laughs> Okay, you all have a card, a comment card, and if you don't, hold your hand up and Jenny will bring you one. Has everybody got one? So if you have any, if I, we talk about a, do we have some more? If I talk about a topic that you'd like to hear more about, because this is going to be a broad general topic. So it's really challenging because... Um, it's really challenging because when we invite people, we say, we're going to get down to the basics. We're going to do this on a high school level. We're going to try and make it as elementary as possible. Well, we've been doing this for 30 years in Kerrville and 20 years in Fredericksburg. Some of you are way past that high school level. <laughs> Some of you were way past that high school level when you started coming, and we appreciate that. That makes it a challenge for us to make a presentation. So we're trying to do the basics of investment, investing in today's economy. So I tried to find some things to add to it that would give you an update even if you are a sophisticated investor. So it's been a challenging time. The market's been insanely challenging. And of course, it's been challenging for me since I saw y'all last time. I'm a year older. So that's, that's always a challenge. And my husband gave me a birthday card, leaned it against the toaster of all things, and it says, four out of five birthday cards have money in them. Happy birthday, number five. <laughs> so we've got the market, I've got a birthday, and I've got a husband that can't put money in my birthday card. <laughs> so, I forgot what I was gonna tell you next. So today's economy is a big challenge also. So let's t back to the, y'all are all in a different place. Some of you are, I prefer to figure it out myself. Some of you are, I'd like to work as a team. Some of you are just need a little guidance and I'm good. And some of you are, please can someone just take care of this for me. <laughs> I'd really prefer if we could all be in this all work as a team one because that's the way that we like to work, because we really like for you to be part of what we, we're doing. We think that knowledge is power. That's, that's really our mission statement for Joseph Financial Partners, is that knowledge is power. This is part of the LPL presentation where it says knowledge is investing power. And so we tried to think of some things that would bring you more knowledge than just coming here. I'm very proud of our newsletter. I don't do them, Jody sends them out. And I think they're excellent. This is the latest one. And I brought it just to show you that it's short and it has graphs in it, which I really like. And it's not a lot of Wall Street gobbledygook. 
and it should come to you in your email. If it doesn't, that's what that comment card is for. If, we, if you have not been getting this, it comes on Tuesday nights. So that's the LPL research newsletter. Then on our website, there's, oops, sorry. On our LPL website, there's also some really good information. There's a tab that says resource center. And under that, there are all kinds of investment topics and there are little videos that go with them. So I would encourage you to look there. There's also a glossary that has, like if you read, some, say you read something in the newsletter and you're not sure what that word means. If you go to our website and go to the glossary, the term will probably be there. We also think that Squawk Box on CNBC that comes on at eight o'clock in the morning is a really good general look at the market. I've been a broker for so long, I know what a Squawk Box is. When I first began, every office had a little box in it like this, and it was before audio transmission was very good. And so at 6.30 in the morning, the research team would meet in their conference room and they would let you know what they think about the next, you know, whatever stock it was they were following. And so I would take the bus to downtown Houston and walk across the bridge and step over the drunks that were sleeping under newspapers to try to get there by 6.30 so I could hear what was on the squawk box. My, how things have changed. And then finally, the Wall Street Journal. It's still a great document. Now, I'm not saying subscribe to it. It's too expensive to subscribe to, but I always pick it up when I'm in the airport, so something like that. So, okay. So if we're going to have basic investment knowledge, we have to talk the talk. So the first thing is the market. On the nightly news, they always talk about the market. Well, they're talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is only 30 stocks, 30 industrial stocks that are selected by the Dow Jones Publishing Company, the same company that pu publishes the Wall Street Journal. And they try to make a list of the 30 stocks that are leading indicators for the economy. So they are really trying to predict the future by, by, have, by, predict, by showing you these 30 stocks. It was actually started in 1896 and is still going. We gave you a, the list, and I think on your handout it's pretty hard to read. But I think it's interesting to see that Coca-Cola's on there, but not Pepsi. <laughs> Home Depot's on there, but not Lowe's. Merck's on there, but not Pfizer. I don't know how they make the decisions. The oldest one on there, remember how old the index is, 1896. The oldest stock on there is 3M, added in 1976. In fact, in the 20s, they kicked Coca-Cola off of the list because it was too international. When they brought it back in in the 80s, it was far more international than it was when they kicked it off. So it's a year-by-year -year thing, them trying to decide what to have on there. The newest ones are 2020. In 2020, they said, oh my goodness, we have left technology out completely. So they added Amgen, which is biotechnology. They added Honeywell, which is industrial. That didn't help much for their technology. And they added Salesforce, which is a, cons a customer resource management software to keep track you know, a database to keep track of your customers, which was kind of unusual. They don't have Microsoft. No, they do have Microsoft, I'm sorry, and Apple. Apple was added in 2015 and Microsoft was in 1999. So when they're talking about the Dow, about the market, they're usually talking about that Dow Jones Industrial Average. And sometimes the commentator will some, like, say something like, the market was up almost 300 points today. And you don't know whether, you know, the Dow is at 33,000 right now. So 300 points, even 3,000 points is not a whole lot. So it all depends on what the, in, the number of the index as to whether the number that they're saying makes a great deal of difference. The biggest exchange that, that's part of the market is the NASDAQ. That's, it's also the newest, and it has thousands of stocks on it. And it stands for North American Security Dealers Automated Quotes. So it was, it was a big deal when it came out because it was the first online trading. 
It's, it's dominated by Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, and I mean dominated, like about 40% of the value is those stocks. But it also has crazy stocks like Boston Beer, <laughs> Core Laboratories, Fasty and, Com Com Fa Fasty and Compass Materials. And then there's also this note that all companies here, this is LPL, is for educational purposes only. I didn't think we were recommending them. And not an indication of trading intent or solicitation of products. So I just want y'all to make sure that I wasn't saying you should buy all those stocks. I'm just saying they're on the index. The other one is the S&P 500. And for more and more investors, this has come to mean the market. So where did we get the S&P 500? Oh, I forgot to tell See these cute little guys? Those are our youngest grandsons. <laughs> And they are in a video game that makes it look like they're driving a car. And I think they really believe they are. They're so, so, I, I missed another one. This one, wait, hang on, I went too far. Come on. That's Jody reading to first graders at uh, Fredericksburg Elementary School, which he does often. Okay, back to our little grandsons. And where did the S&P 500 come from? Aren't they cute? They are. And so the S&P 500 comes from Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's is simply a credit rating organization. So they, re they rate companies and countries from AAA to D. And so naturally, they're gonna come up, there's gonna be the cream that rises to the top. And so they publish the top 500. So that is the S&P 500. They just are the largest US stocks according to S&P's figure. So somebody, actually a guy named John Bogle said, why don't we make this into an index and make this into a mutual fund? And that was the first index fund, which buys all 500 of the S&P 500. And, and they're not, S&P is not recommending their, these stocks. They're not saying one's better than the other. It's just these are the largest. Okay, so that's talking the talk. So this is the heart of the presentation, the four steps. So number one, which investments are right for you. Number two, embrace diversification. Number three, understand how the economy affects your portfolio. And number, five, number four, find a professional. So number one, which investments are right for you? So we're trying to define what they are before you, how else do you decide if they're right for you? So we can take most investments and, the, and divide them into three categories, stock, which is ownership, bonds, which is loanership. And so I had stocks, own, bonds, loan, cash. I couldn't come up with anything. Y'all can probably think of something, but all I could think of was how cash works and I came up with bone. <laughs> so my idea was that a dog takes a bone and buries it in the ground, thinking it's a really tasty morsel. When he goes back to dig it up, it's not quite, it's still there, your cash is still there, it, the dog still gets the bone, but it is not in the condition that it was when he put it in there. So I think own, loan, and bone works really well. So jumping into the own part. So stocks or stock mutual funds, this is another LPL slide, you can tell, because there's a disclaimer. Investing in stocks includes numerous specific risks, numerous specific risks, including fluctuation of dividends, which doesn't happen much, loss of principal, and potential illiquidity of the investment in a falling market. Do y'all want me to go do the top of the, mar of the slide now? I mean, it makes it sound like your money was at such risk, but still, it's where most people have their money invested. So stocks is ownership. If you have a stock, you own an individual stock, you own part of the company. If you own stocks in a mutual fund, those stocks are part ownership of companies. It's the risk is higher, but the return potential is much higher. The appropriate time frame for investing in stocks is long-term especially for retirement. In fact, I don't see how anybody could prepare for a good retirement without stock investing. 
And finally, it's not good for short-term investing, like buying a car, unless you're planning to buy a car three years from now, put it on order and get it when it comes in. Okay, so that's our definition of stocks. So bonds, which is loanership, or bond mutual funds, are made up of loan, you're loaning your money to companies, municipalities, governments, and they use that money to finance projects, projects or finance operations. So this, I disagree with this statement, and if any of you are taking notes, you may want to change, it says principal and stated interest rate paid back at formal maturity date. Principal is paid back at the formal maturity date, but the interest is paid on almost all bonds every six months. So it's not paid back at the maturity date. So inside a bond mutual fund, those interest payments are coming in and then they pay them out to the mutual fund, to the bond fund holders, bond mutual fund holders on a monthly basis. So it's, I don't know why, I guess because they set up the bond portfolio so there's a constant stream of income and even though the bonds pay every six months, the bond mutual funds pay every month. It's moderate risk and moderate returns, and it provides an alternative to stocks, which is the main reason that bonds are in people's investment portfolio, just to be an alternative. Some people call it an insurance policy against the downturn in the market. And finally, the bone or the cash, typically, when we're talking about cash or cash equivalents, we're talking about a money market fund. But it can also be bank accounts, CDs, and this is low risk, low return. Or in a time like this, it's low risk, negative return. Because at 7% inflation, you're losing 7% of your money every year in a, in a cash account. So you don't want too much there, but you've got to have it there. Oops, sorry. You've got to have it there for short-term goals, like buying a car, or an emergency account. And part of what we help people with is trying to figure out how much to have in an emergency account. So this little disclaimer tells us that the money market funds are not insured by FDIC. I think everybody knew that, but. So why bother with all three? Well, we need all three to have a good, strong portfolio. So we brought in, our LPL brought in, the Ibbotson chart. Ibbotson is a company that for decades has been the number cruncher of the industry. And they make beautiful charts and graphs. Not that this is one of them, but this is one of their long ones. So we have 92 years of results. So if we take 92 years of small company stocks, the return is 11.8%. And 92 years of large company stocks, we have a return of 10%. Government bonds, meaning the 10-year bond is what we use there. It's 5.5%. Treasury bills, which is, a, is the same as cash, 3.3%. And during all this time, inflation has been 2.9%. So we do it so that we get enough return to have enough money to live on for the rest of our lives. Moving on to step two. Embrace diversification. And the Kerrville Group, where I've been doing these for 30 years, there's a little lady that I, every time I say, start to say the word diversification, she screams out, diversification. It's her favorite word. <laughs> cute, cute little, I don't think, I was thinking today, she's been coming from day one. We've been doing it for 30 years, 10 months of every year. And I think she's missed two or three in that whole time. So anyway, she's got diversification stuck in her head. So we balance our portfolio with different investment op options from different investment classes. And we, they, we, you always hear the statement, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, that's not good enough. If you don't put all your eggs in one basket, does that mean we're supposed to have 20 baskets with a couple of eggs in each basket? It's got to be more specific. So that's why we do the stocks, bonds, and cash thing. Those are really your three baskets. I had a, had a couple of ladies come to see me in Kerrville and they said, we've got a greatly diversified portfolio. They had a growth and income fund from every 
mutual fund company available. So their portfolio was not diversified at all. They just had the same investment from every company. Or the sa I've also had people say, I'm well diversified. I have a CD at Security, and I have one at Chase, and I have one at Pioneer, and I'm diversified. No, that's not diversified either. So you were supposed to all get a, a lifesaver, package of lifesavers when you came in. So while I tell the story, I'll have them pass them out. There's a guy named Clark Kane, and back in 1912, he was a chocolatier. Now, in 1912, being a chocolatier was difficult, made the summers very difficult. So he wanted to come up with a candy that didn't melt in the heat. So he created Lifesavers, hard candy, that, and it was round, and it was white when he first made it. So he thought it looked like a Lifesaver, so he had the forms made so that it would say Lifesaver. So a guy named, mm, I can't remember his name. Oh, Jay Nolan, who ended, he ended up being the CEO or the beginning guy with ABC and then went on to be in the Department of Commerce in the 1930s. But so he offered this crane guy $2,900 to buy the Lifesaver Candy Company. He bought it diversified the pack, like the diversified packs that you now have. Thank you, ladies. And he became a billionaire, which was how he had the money to start ABC. So American Broadcasting Company came from Lifesavers because they were so diversified. So diversification is hugely important. Okay, step three, understand how the economy affects your portfolio. And when you do, would you please call me <laughs> and explain it to me and I'll explain it to the team and we'll go forward. There are, you know how many economists there are in the world and you know what uh, Del Franklin Delano Roosevelt said about economists. He wanted one that only had one hand so that they couldn't say this might happen in the economy, but on the other hand, <laughs> this might happen. And so there's always the joke about wanting the one-handed economists because economists always hedge their bets. So if you think that you don't quite understand how the economy affects your portfolio, you're in great company. You're right up there with the professionals because they can't keep up with it either. But what we do know is there are a bunch of economies, but that the world economy, the world has gotten so much smaller because of technology. So, so many economies have, in, we are not an isolated economy. Other, eco other economies influence our economy. And all of them have an economic cycle. So the economic cycle is growth, peak, recession, growth, peak, recession. And when I do that, that looks so nice and easy, but it may be growth like we just had, a recession like the pandemic was, and then growth, and then now we're gonna have a Ukraine, pan you know, it's not, even though we always say it that way, that's not how it is. You could have a long growth period, you can have a short recession, you can have a quick peak, but there still is always an economic cycle. And what dictates the economic cycle? It's dictated by supply and demand. If we have a balance of supply and of demand, all is right in the world. But it's never that way. When supply is more than demand, then prices go down and we go into a disinflationary period, which may lead, lead to a recession. When demand is higher than supply, prices go up and we have inflationary times like we're looking at right now. And the, the, that sounds good. Okay, prices are going up until your prices start going up or until they go up so much like they are in Venezuela and there's not enough stuff on the shelves anymore. So trying to get that balance is a huge trick. And the, we expect the Federal Reserve, the central bank, to do it for us. Forget about that one. So inflation is always with us. But again, LPL says, historically, the cost of stuff has always gone up. Well, I'm, always is a hard word to use in any sort of investment, 
but always gone up is not exactly true. Sometimes things go down, but inflation is really, let me get this right. The ever increasing cost of goods and services, which causes an ever decreasing purchasing power of the dollar an ever increasing cost of goods and services. And it, the def, the, that's the economic de definition. And so I guess it, you know, it says always going up is not really that much of a misnomer because it's, it, we're happy when it's 2%. And if it's negative, we, it's like the world is coming to an end. Or if we just don't have any growth at all, it's like the world is coming to an end. So it's the rate that inflation goes up, that's, the, that's a problem. So we're worried about it right now because it's going up at about 7%. So low inflation equals slow growth. We really don't like that, but what we really don't like is high inflation because we have the fear of overheating. So what we, oh, and this, this is a, that's, that's from the year I started driving. <laughs> And this right here, that's a screw. That's not a decimal point. <laughs> the decimal point's out here. That's 27 cents for gasoline. Yes, sir? Become a place <laughs> Yes. Yes, and we still have some of them. Dr. Parton asked, Does it ca did it come with plates and dishes too? Yes, and we still have some of those. Exactly. With a, only with a fill-up, though. So what we use to try and control inflation is interest rates. And the central bank or the Federal Reserve has control of interest rates. And so that's when it gets interesting. We say the Federal Reserve has an influence over interest rates. Well, they actually only set interest rates for what the Federal Reserve charges their member banks for overnight. That's all. But when they change interest rates, interest rates in the whole world move. And when they raise interest rates, all bonds go down in value. And when they lower interest rates, all bonds go up in value. So we've had a time period where they've been lowering interest rates and our bond portfolios have looked very healthy. That's going to change because I think tomorrow will probably be the first time the first Fed funds rate, and it'll probably be a quarter of a percentage point. Now that doesn't sound like much, but to the market, it's a, it's a big deal. And the reason it's a big deal, you think, okay, they're changing the rate on interest rates. Why do my stocks care? Why do the people that buy and sell stocks care? When the Fed is raising interest rates, they're trying to put the brake on the market, they're on the whole economy. They're trying to slow the whole economy down. Well, stocks don't want the market the economy slowed down. It makes them uncomfortable. It makes investors uncomfortable. There's a debate right now, is the Fed going to raise four, five, six, seven times? Some prognosticators are saying there may be seven raises. The lowest number I've heard is four. So as I said to you last month, this is not going to be a good year in the market. That doesn't mean that you should be out of the market. It actually means it's a great time to be adding to your investments. And those of you that have mutual fund investments think, well, I don't have any money to add to the market. You already invested all of it. The good news is you are reinvesting in the down market every quarter. You have those dividends that are going in and being reinvested in your mutual fund. So now while investments are down, you still own the same number of shares you owned, except the dividend comes in, you're buying more shares every quarter. So that's the good news. You are buying low in this market. Step four, find the professional that's right for you. These are the professional services that are offered and you can find people that do it. We actually do all three of them. You can hire someone to consult on an hourly basis. You can hire someone to broker for you. That would be buy something, put it in your account, and charge you a fee for that. That's how brokering works. Or you can hire somebody to manage your portfolio, which would mean an overriding fee that you pay on a quarterly basis. There, all three ways work. What you've got to do is find the one that's right for you. Another LPL slide, can you tell? <laughs> it doesn't have any disclaimers at the bottom, but it's long and wordy. So I tried to make it, we're not allowed to change any of these, so that's why 
that's very frustrating for some of us. Jody more than me, but some of us. And so I just underlined the things that are important. So it's our job to help you understand invest, the different investments that are available. We would like to help you with your financial goals. And we'd like to help you understand your risk tolerance and your time frame. Time frames are usually pretty easy. For, I can tell by looking in this room, and I know most of you, that the time frame is as long as I live. That's my time frame, and I want my money to, ask, to last that long. And your risk tolerance, how can you handle the ups and downs of the market? And many people say, well, I can't handle them. Well, if we go back to the Ibbotson chart, you can't make it on 5% a year for 92 years. You've got to have some of that 10 and 11% in your portfolio. And discuss professionally managed accounts and meet with you on a regular basis. I think this is hugely important. I think not meeting with your advisor, us or whomever your advisor is, at least once a year is foolish. We need to sit down and things change. The market's changing, you're changing, everything's changing. We gotta, we gotta meet. Finally, find your investment mix. Now this is not to say that your investment mix is one of these and they're not very easy to read, and that's okay. Because what I wanted to show you is that you're, if you're conservative, look at the conservative portfolio. It's not all bonds, it's not all cash. It's a lot of bonds, some stocks, and some cash. Let's look over here at the aggressive portfolio. It is not all stocks. It is a lot of stocks, a little bit of bonds, and a little bit of cash. For most of us, we fit in one of these two, moderate growth, the growth or moderate growth category, where you have more of a 60% stocks and 40% bond kind of a balance. But the point is that you need all three of the asset categories to have a good, healthy portfolio. <laughs> I even have a sticker right here so that I can tell you about shrinkflation, and I know you'll all be able to identify with it. I read that an 18 pack of Charmin, now one roll has 244 two ply sheets. It used to have 264. Now 40 sheets doesn't make that much difference. In an 18 pack, it's a roll and a half. That is shrinkflation. I mean, and I, I know you see it in, in everything that you buy, but the toilet paper seemed like a good idea to explain. <laughs> So next month, we're going to talk about annuities, and we have an annuity expert. That's not to, annuities are a perfect example of the investment that's not right for everyone, but you ought to know if it's right for you and why it is, and, or if it's not right for you and why it's not, because it fills a, a, a place in some people's portfolio, and some people should not own any of them. Jody has a new client that came in, and her husband had bought... 12 annuities scattered out with 12 different insurance companies. And she couldn't figure out what she had or what she was doing. So he obviously thought that was his, that was all his baskets. He didn't have all his eggs in one basket. He just had the same investment in, in 12 different baskets. Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't forget to say that. <laughs>